Boom. We're here. We're here. I say that every time. Um, kind of like starting with the same, the same kind of thing, though. Uh, I think that's uh, that's good. Systems are good. Creating systems is a a good practice. But today is man. <laughs> today was a beautiful conversation. Um, we are having we're having real conversations, man. Um, I will say again that, that I said before that I've said before. It is uh, it's powerful to you know to use this platform the right way. You know, a lot of people work within the system. A lot of people don't know what to do and what to say and how to process this and and know what you know. A lot of people don't know what to do. And I talked about it earlier today. And I talked about it a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's not exhausting being black it's at all, not even a little bit. I wouldn't say exhausting. It's not exhausting. It's uh, it's exhausting in this you know time, space, and time to navigate uh, how you want to show up. You know, I just had uh, four brothers on who are showing up in different ways, um, showing up in different ways. That podcast comes out tomorrow. This one's going to come out today. Um, that podcast is going to drop audio and video first thing in the morning. Um, around between seven and nine, it's going to drop, um, probably one of the best podcasts, most that Shelby's podcast, as far as guests go was, um, um, I was one of the best up until now, up until today's podcast, um, but di- good for different reasons. Um, but we're using this platform to have serious conversations, man. Serious fucking conversations. And, you know, I'm only as good as my brain. I'm only as good as the way my brain functions. And it's limited. I'm a fucking idiot, you know. It's only as good as my brain functions. And I need uh, the help of, I need the help of other men and women who know better than me and see counsel. And it's a powerful time, powerful time. I'm loving the fuck out of this black shit right now. I'm seeing some dope ass pro black shit. It's just fire. Um, I'm feeling, I'm feeling, feel, feeling really privileged to be black right now. You know, um, a lot of people are saying like, "I'm sorry for what's going on right now." Like, this means the world is changing. Don't you know? And and phew, there's a little bit of struggle I have, especially in the spaces that I navigate. That um, I don't want anybody feeling sorry for me at all don't feel fucking sorry for me don't feel sorry for black people that's i think we're gonna have to navigate that in the next couple weeks like a lot of white guilt you know you know i get it there's there's an emotional response to this and you know but y'all knew y'all knew don't act like y'all didn't know don't act like y'all didn't know you chose to people chose to go on about their lives they said it's not happening to me so it's not a problem and then when if you didn't agree, you say, oh, that's just them being them. That's just them blaming the world. There's a lot of that shit, you know, but don't feel bad for me. This is this is what makes black people so powerful is we deal, we've been dealing with this and we still out here influencing culture. We're still out here crushing it. You know what I mean? And dealing with all this bullshit. And some of us are not crushing it. Um, but that's okay. We still survive. We still make the best of it. Best of it. We still go to college. We still sing. We dance. We influence the fuck out of this culture. And you know, don't feel bad for me. Feel bad for the evil people. Um, feel bad for you not for you not showing up. Um, and 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 for you not showing up the way you should have been turning a blind eye. If you feel guilty for that, that's you. You feel guilty because you knew that people were struggling and chose not to do anything because it's not affecting you. That's what privilege is. Privilege is saying, I think this is a problem, but it's not a problem for me. But we have white allies, you know, our white allies need to, you know, need to step up. Um, When the LGBT community, you know, came up, um, white men and women are in the LGBT community and fought and were influenced um, to make the world a better place, you know? So we need everybody to fight and influence to make this thing happen. And we need people to just stop being 
Don't be whack. And people ask me, like, what can we do? Don't be fucking whack, man. Just be chill. Don't think that I'm trying to take from you or don't think that, you know, just don't, just don't be whack, bro. And let's all, you know, let's have a government, let's have a country where the system supports people, not supports people financially, but supports people to succeed. And I think that's what people are protesting is that the system right now doesn't support everybody, doesn't work for everybody. But white people say, it, are working with our white allies, they're like, it's working well for me. So it's, it's not a problem. But let's just all be chill about it. Like I've said over and over and over again, I know plenty about the Holocaust and and civil uh, and the Civil War and Vietnam War and even the Native American, you know, indigenous, uh, um, uh, you know, colonization of our countries and and the, um, you know, fuck, I can't think of the word. You know, I know the word. You know, I know. You know, I know. Got Perrier today. I'm sipping that Perrier, son. We fancy. But just be fucking cool, man. Just be cool and know, know that the system is not is not supportive of everybody. Morally supportive. Um, it's interesting. It's an interesting time. I don't got the answers. I know what I'd like. I know what I'd like. I'd like to not. I'd like to not battle subtle racism. I just like to live my life and and succeed and not face stupid barriers. They're just dumb. Professional barriers. That's annoying. I don't want to deal with professional barriers. I want you to look at me. As a leading professional in my field, I want you to look at me as a high, I provide a high quality service. That's how I want you to look at me. I want you to look at my intellect. I want you to look at, you know, I don't, I don't want anything special. I want to get rid of subtle racism. That's the shit that keeps that that gets fucking annoying. That's annoying to me. But I'm very privileged. I'm not, you know, I'm very privileged. So, but that's why that's annoying to me. So that's what I. You know, but, and also, I just talked about this with the brothers that were just on uh, after the podcast. We didn't say it on the podcast, but us who grew up with kind of as privileged people of color, you know, privileged, you know, we grew up with intellectual parents. We grew up with uh, parents who taught us something different than the, not even general, generally, you know, black people are not fucking, I don't know what y'all think, but everybody in my neighborhood in New York was just, try, most people, 90% of people were just trying to work and come home and live a fine life. Um, but the ones the ones of us who got to see generations of success, um, we get to lead this in our own way. We get to speak on a microphone and speak up against this. We get to um, lead by example. We get to show people what it looks like, what it looks like, what it sounds like. You know, um, you know, but you know, um, oh, I'm gonna cut this clip. A hey, soundbite. Um, but we we're doing that. What is blackness project? And you know, I we started recording that two months ago. Two months ago, you know, I, if you don't know, I talked about it a little bit on the podcast. But I asked, I asked black men and women, what is blackness to you? First of all. White people don't, a lot of white people, I don't think, ask themselves, themselves, what is whiteness? They don't have to. But we are so, there's so many levels to the, you know, annoying level of, you know, um, you know, injustice that we have to ask ourselves. We have to reflect and look at ourselves. We have to reflect and have pride in who we are. We have to, we have to ask ourselves these questions. Um, I don't know if Asian people ask themselves what is being a, what is being Korean to me. I don't know if they do. I don't know if they ask themselves that. But I asked uh, black men and women what is blackness to them, and now is the best time to drop this project. So we have we have a little piece coming out um, in the next couple of weeks, a uh, week or so uh, during this time, just to let people know this is what this is to us, to some of us. This is what it is, and. We're proud. What is blackness to me? I told, I said before, blackness is everything. It's it's two chains. It's Marcy Projects. It's Barack Obama. It's Colin Powell. It's Jay Z. It's me. It's my brother. It's my mom. It's all of us. Everything in between. It's everything. It's pride. It's it's powerful. It's resilience. It's exceptional. That's what it is to me. 
what's exceptional. It's everything in between. It's infinite. It's allowed to be everything. I feel like I, one of the things that I've said is don't just covet black men and black women. Don't just covet our music and our style. Don't just covet it and not think of us as equals. Understand that we're powerful. We have a rich history. That's what blackness is to me. Um, but what else? It's enough. It's enough. Um, this is going to be a short one today. Uh, but tomorrow we have, or not tomorrow, yeah, tomorrow uh, we have uh, my friend Gabby coming in. She is a powerful black woman. Um, she has a very she has a story similar to mine, in the sense that her you know her ethnicity is questioned by both black men and women and white people. There's that's an interesting dynamic that we a lot of us have to navigate. You're not black enough. Why? <laughs> why? I, I do you know why? Why not? Why am I not black enough? And then you never be white. You'll never be white. Oh my God, racial ambiguity. <laughs> what the fuck? Where? Do, who am I with? But then you know, I found my own little team of misfits. Then I have my family. I have my family, and there they deal have dealt with the same things. You know what I mean? So, and then you know, people like Abby and a lot of people, a lot of the people of color here in San Diego have. I've heard that story countless times. Of like, you're not black enough. What the fuck is... Th That's why we have to ask ourselves, what is blackness to you? It's weird. It's weird. <laughs> That's where I talk about black people. We have to ask ourselves some questions. Because there's division within us. You know, there's colorism. You know, you're too dark. You're dark, you're dark skin. You're not beautiful. You know, there's uh, body positivity and lack thereof. You know, fat black people... X, Y, Z, whatever bullshit somebody wants to say or whatever tattoos and, you know, non-tattoos and for successful black people and not, you know, like not successful, but successful in the sense of the corporate sense or the white collar sense. What the fuck? Why do we do this to ourselves? But that, see, and this is the parts of institutional racism and cultural racism that have that people don't really realize. And it's very abstract and it's hard to realize and put it, put really, um, it's not tangible, but learning black people hating themselves, learning to hate themselves. Malcolm X, who taught you to hate your hair? Who taught you to hate the, the brother next to you? Who taught you that? Who taught you to 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 not think of not think of yourself as beautiful? Who taught you that? Who taught you to put a product in your hair and straighten your hair? Who taught you? Who taught you to wear that blonde wig? Who fucking taught you that? Who taught you that speaking this way was speaking, you know, enunciating your words? Who taught you that that was fucking wrong and not black? Who taught you that? White people talk this way and black people talk this way. White people dress this way and black people dress this way. Who fucking taught you that? And that's part of institutional racism and cultural racism. Like, you're pretty for a black girl. You're well-spoken for a black guy. You're the only kind of black person that I would date. That, 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 that fucked up shit you hear like that. That's the kind of shit I heard is growing up. I heard from people I was friends with we're your friend, but we're going to call you a nigger because we're your friend and we're allowed to. Uh, and my boy on the podcast just talked about, um, you know, b being, feeling pride and reverse feeling shitty about what we allowed before we were awoken, before we were conscious. Think, think of the things we're allowed and think of the things we did to ourselves, or this is where I took it, but where I thought of, but think of the things that I did to myself and I, I allowed myself that made me hate myself. I only really have my twenties. I've grown into this, this uh, pr pride of my blackness in my twenties. I didn't, I didn't, you know, and not because my parents didn't teach me, but because people taught me to hate it. Fuck. But I don't like to play the victim. Let me just say that shit right now. I don't give a fuck what adversity you put in front of me. It's going to be annoying, but it's not going to stop me from doing what I got to do. Go fuck yourself. Sometimes I feel like I want to succeed. I got a chip on my shoulder. Sometimes I want to succeed to say, fuck you. You're not going to stop me from, you know, I'm going to join this networking group, even though I'm the only black person in this group. Yeah, I'm the only black person in this group and I'm going to dress the way I want to dress and be the way I want to be. And I'm unfucking deniable You cannot stop me. I don't play no victim shit. Eh. And m most black people don't. Most black people are, we're not asking for a fucking favor. I'm not asking for a handout. 
I'm not asking for a handout. Quality of opportunity, not a quality of outcome. Some people fail. I fail a lot. I want to be able to fail and not look at less than because I failed. I want to be able to fail freely. I want to be able to do like Donald Trump does and go bankrupt five times. I want to be able to do that. And I want to succeed and I want to fail equally. That's what I want. I don't want any fucking handouts. Most black people fucking don't. We don't want to, we're not victims. I'm going to show up anyway. But that's also, what is blackness? Blackness is resilience in that regard. We just show up anyway. Oh, they're going to judge you? So I'm still going to show up. Still going to show up in these white spaces. Show out. Be myself. Be fucking excellent. That's why blackness is so dope. And that's in our blood. That's in our blood. That's in our blood to just show up like that. We talk, uh, Minneapolis talked about defunding the police and investing in communities of uh, color. I don't know how I feel about that. You know, when I say when I hear defunding the police, I'm hoping they're demilitari- demilitarizing the police. That's what I hope. That's what I hope for. I hope they're they're gonna. I hope they're gonna stop patrolling neighborhoods, searching for crime, criminalizing people because they have to, because that's the thing. That's the thing in in La Jolla. Cops come to La Jolla to make sure everything's okay. They're like, oh, no one, you know, they're just roaming around making sure things are okay or parking and like if they get a call. But in communities of color, they're searching. I remember, I remember p- cops just cruising around searching for people. Even even in communities with young people, they're just searching for you. They're hunting. So that's what I'm hoping when they. Um, defund the police and also knowing that investing in communities of color like jordan brand invested invested a hundred million dollars in community in communities of color i don't know what that looks like but he did it over 10 years um it's got to be over 30 years on the podcast that drops tomorrow homeboy talks about for 400 years y'all have been playing monopoly and then when we don't play when we're not following the rules, when we're not playing to the best of our ability, you wonder why, but we haven't been playing for 400 years. Y'all been practicing. You know, I hope, uh, I hope when they talk about, you know, I hope when they talk about defunding the police, they're saying we're going to invest in communities of color in the long term, in the long term. So, you know, um, and we have to ask ourselves and have black conversations in our own, amongst ourselves saying, hey, are we doing our best, yes, system is fucked up, but are we doing our best? Difficult conversation. You know, it's a difficult conversation, man. I don't know. I don't know. I don't got you. I don't got the answer, Sway. You ain't got the answer, Sway. I don't got the answers. I don't know. I'm just trying to navigate it and do the best I can do with uh, what I have and with in the positions I set myself up in. Um, and, uh, just do the best I can. Um, that's all you do. You do the best you can. Uh, so tomorrow we have Gabby. She's going to come tell her story. She's dope. She's, she's dope, dope, dope. Um, and then, uh, we have, uh, what's his name? Sorry. Let me look his name up. Um, yeah, I'm making y'all wait. Um, Corey George, boom, mental health counselor, uh, crisis intervention and certified clinical trauma professional, author, host and, and producer, one-on-one with Corey George. Have a conversation about black trauma, cultural tra- trauma, generational trauma, serious conversation, man, you know, um, if you think about it, think about this. If you grew up, if you grew up in a community where there's gang violence, there is um, lack of education, so there's hostility because people are not thinking critically, um, and then there's a intense police presence, and there's maybe single family, single parent households. Would you be anxious? Would you be anxious? And 
anxiety of see here's what people don't know about anxiety anxiety is more than me biting my nails anxiety is more than panic attacks anxiety is heightened awareness hypervigilance and anxiety is also irritability and anger when i'm sometimes when i'm anxious my, i have less patience for my children so black anxiety do you think do you think that living in under those circumstances for generations because it's proven that trauma changes our cellular makeup. Are we ready to have this fucking conversation? Are we ready to do this? Because it's a serious conversation, man. And culture, you, we have to heal. We talked about that on the podcast today that's going to come out tomorrow. I don't even know what I'm going to name it. I think I might name it Black Conversations. I think I might name it Black Conversations, but uh, yeah, that's the name. But, um, you know, healing, but that takes humility. But I think for me, I've struggled in certain regards. I had a chip on my shoulder, like I said before, which makes it so I have to, it's hard to humble yourself when you're expected to show up despite all your, your issues. But I'm no victim. I'm going to show up anyway, son. Son. I'm going to show up anyway. But it takes humility to heal. It takes humility to heal. It takes humility to say that I'm not okay. I'm not okay. You know, this guy, you know, you know, would uh, send me porn when I was a little kid. That negatively affected my my hypersexuality. That's not okay. I'm not okay from that. I struggle. That's that was hard for me to handle. Um, that that brought up questions that a kid shouldn't have been asking himself. I'm not okay. That's not okay. I got to work at that. That takes going to therapy. That takes uh, healing. That takes looking at myself. It takes time and effort. Bandwidth. It takes emotional bandwidth. And if you're working 60 hours a week, do you have the emotional bandwidth to heal? I got to raise these kids. I got to show up at work. I got to work two jobs. I have to excel on a professional level much further than my white counterparts. It's exhausting. Being black is not exhausting. The obstacles you face and how to show up in those obstacles, that's exhausting. Our existence isn't fucking exhausting. But, um, you know, healing, you know, healing and understanding things are not okay. Those kids who, who you know, told me that the, the parents won't have black people over for dinner, that's not okay. I'm not okay from that. I'm not okay from that. I have a complex from that. That's hard. That's hard. You know? Um, so it's going to be dope to have Corey George on to have these conversations. Because I think right now there's such momentum that we can amplify black voices and black experience. This black power shit right now is dope. This shit is dope. Seeing, hearing, um, you know, speeches from my heroes and, and um, just seeing... Black, hearing black music. I've been listening to nothing but revolutionary black music. Jay Electronica, Joey Badass, Run the Jewels, Brother Ali. You know, been listening to a lot of powerful black music. Uh, black Star's coming out with a um, an album, you know, at some point. Yasin Bey and uh, Talib Kweli coming out with coming out with another album. Going to bless black people. Going to bless uh, black ears with some fire. You know, um, Code of the Friend with some healing black music. I'm going to do a whole podcast on hip hop and my love for hip hop. Um, but I tell I tell people it's my birthright. That is that is my that is in my blood. I, it gives me goosebumps. Music gives me, get, black music, hip hop gives me goosebumps every day. Every day when I drive, I get, I have a physical reaction to hip hop music. It feels so much more powerful than just like a song. It feels like this is a reflection of who I am in music. Loud when a music when when a song is bumping in your car, and it's the lyrics are playing the the bars are are talking about your life today, or talking about where you want your life to be, or talking about like just feeling good about yourself and fucking you know music that that excites your ego. That feels good. Like I'm dressed. I got my fucking Mets jersey on. I'm dressed. Ah, I'm a cruise. That shit feels dope. And then also when you hear powerful black messages, like yo, they're telling my story. When you talk about 
when you hear J. Cole talk about meditation, you're like, yo, this man's speaking. Fuck, man. I don't know if I don't know if pe- other people have that response to their to their music. My girl does it. My girl's like, it doesn't do that to me, you know. But that's you know, um, black people are so sensual, and I, we you know that's interesting when I talk about fucking black men and black women and not thinking of us as equal. People appreciate like our sensuality. People ex- ex- appreciate our sexuality. Like, oh, big black, you know, muscular guy. That's you know hyper people were hypersexualized, you know, um and also personal responsibility. I think black men and women um are hypersexualized as a defense mechanism as well. It is a I, I think, you know, this healthy and unhealthy behavior, but having there's a guy who cut my hair a couple of days, weeks ago, he has seven kids. Uh, too many. <laughs> Fuck. Too many kids. It's too many kids. But it's a clear hypersexuality and clear, maybe it's a coping mechanism. If we talk about sex, can we talk about sex addiction in the black community? I don't know who I would fucking talk to about that. I don't know who I would talk to about that. Maybe I'll talk to Corey George about black sexuality. Write that down. But that's, um, that's interesting. Maybe it's like, you know, you know, a resp- uh, trauma response. Oh, difficult conversation. I heard a story of a of a black uh, black kid in Miami lose, you know, saying that saying on a podcast that black kids lose their virginity at ten years old in cer- certain places. What? That is not fucking normal. I'm not gonna. I I can't fact check that. But if that's really happening, that's crazy. That is irresponsible on the parents' behalf, then like that, those are the things that are difficult in black communities. Those are the things that are like, what, how do we fix that? How do we work on that? But I think that's a, a healing from the trauma. I think healing, healing that trauma. Um, I don't know if hypersexuality is a trauma response, but it, I, I think it might be. I don't know. I don't know. But I don't even know who the fuck to talk to about that because there's a lot of pride in our sexual prowess. Twerking. I like twerking too. It's fun. Uh, not me do, not me doing the twerking, but watching people. It's awesome. It's like, good for you, young lady. Appreciate you. So I like that too, you know. I'm, I'm a hypersexual person, but mine's a trauma response. I was sexualized as a, as a little kid. So very times when people are, uh, are, are victims of, of sexual trauma, when people are victims of sexual trauma, hypersexuality is a response. Women who are sexually assaulted, a lot of times, people, people, not even women, people deal with hypersexuality after sexual trauma. So is that part of blackness? Is that a trauma response? I don't know the answer to that, but I'll, I'll ask Corey George. Write that down. But these are black conversations. These are cool. These are cool, important things that this is the time to talk about, you know, this is the time to talk about. Um, But we talked on that, on the podcast that comes out tomorrow, keep plugging that with those, uh, those four brothers. uh, We talked about um, black economy, that we need to build a black economy. Um, That's challenging. That's going to take generations. But I think everybody sitting at this table was a black entrepreneur. Everybody at the table um, was independent, you know. Um, we have taken our financial security into our own hands, which is that's a privilege that we get to do that. It's a privilege. So I'm not. So that's why it was cool to talk to those men because we're coming from we're coming from a place of privilege, being able to speak and lead by example. But getting out of the system because we talk about I talked about it with Travis. Um, throwback. I talked about with Travis before on the podcast. When you work for someone, you you make seven thousand dollars a month, right? And then you get your life accustomed to a seven thousand dollar a month life. And I do this shit too, you know. I make this mistake too. I make it less now, but you get yourself accustomed to a seven thousand dollar a month life. And now you've been making seven thousand dollars a month for five years. For five years, now can you leave that job? Can you leave that job and take a pay cut to five thousand dollars in order to? in order to uh, advance more quickly in another position. 
that's hard. You're going to say, I'm going to make less money to advance? It's hard, man. And a lot of people make that mistake. And I think there's a level of demoralization why people like myself need to buy shoes. When you when you make money, you're like, fuck, I got this money. Let me, you know, get, get fit. See? It's fucked up. But I think everybody does that. I think white people do that too. You know? Like, oh, I'm going to buy Gucci because, you know, Really, the people who can afford Gucci are not usually not the people who wear Gucci. <clears throat> if you make seven thousand dollars a month, you can't really afford Gucci. Like you shouldn't. That's a that's poor priorities. But people are like want to feel good, want to feel like I earned this, you know. Unless you save up like hella money to to do it. Yeah, but. I think this is I think this is it. How am I doing? Um really quick, it was good to spend quality intimate time with my family. Shout out to my girl for for allowing me to take emotional space to figure out how I, who I want to be during this time. And let me just say I'm proud of who the fuck I show up as cuz this even doing a fucking any of this, all the stuff that I do that I get to post about and get to be about all the stuff that I do, I am not this fucking person. And there's people who are going to see what I'm saying right now who know exactly what the fuck I'm talking about. This is not who I am. I am not this guy. I am a taker. I am a taker and I am rude and I am generally restless, irritable, and discontent. And I've been that most of my life. So being able to be the person I am today, raise my children, do a podcast, start a business, bleh, 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 all the things I'm able to do, it's not who I am. So I'm very proud of that right now. And I don't know. You know, there's pride in reverse. So I've talked about it on the podcast ad nauseum. Ad nauseum. I just learned that. So I'm pretty stoked about it. I used to say it all the time, but I used to say at nauseum. Uh, dumb. But anyway, um, I'm proud of who I'm showing up as. I'm proud of who I'm showing up as. I get to, I think, how can I help people? That's my thing. I think, how can I show up and be of service? How can I put information out there? How can I use my experience to help others? A sponsor told me, Eric, you are uniquely prepared to serve others. I'll remember that to the day I die. So if you have a hard time, if you have adversity that, you know, fucks you up, you can learn how to use that adversity to save save lives and change the world. And I think in the whatever capacity that I am, I'm, I'm sharing a positive experience and a positive thing. So I'm proud of who I'm showing up as, you know? If you're going to mentally masturbate in your pain, you also have to mentally masturbate in your good and in your joy. <sighs> Heavy. But I'm um, proud of the way I'm showing up. Shout out to my girl for allowing me to show up this way. She knows this is greater than me. She knows this is our children. She knows I am leading I'm leading our family in a way that she's not able to. She's able to lead the family in a lot of ways spiritually. In a spiritual sense, she is the spiritual leader of our household. You know, so so shout out to her for being able to do that. But in in regards to sh sharing the way I share, she's not able to do that. And she allows me space to do that. So shout out to her, man. And shout out to my mixed race family. I raise, my oldest son is Mexican and white. My son is white and black. My girl's white. I'm white and black. <sighs> we are doing it. I'm doing it. Just do this. Just be chill like everybody just talking about it with the engineers before this like white people are like what do we do just be fucking chill just think of me as equal the way i think of you as equal know about my history like i know about yours and be fucking cool just be cool and you see this shit, you see shit's fucked up vote for people and participate in democracy to make sure it doesn't do this to other people make sure it doesn't make sure other people don't feel like this that's what you can do just be chill and use your gifts to help people who are less fortunate. You know, my friend's a doctor. Um, she's a sweet person. I know her heart. Her heart is good. She said, what can I do? I said, you are, you're a doctor. You can serve communities that are, you know, where there are medical um, um, disparities. Look up, look, read the book, Medical Apartheid, and see the, med the disparities in communities of color medically. Look into it. Black women die disproportionately during childbirth. Why? Look at, why is that? Do you think we're just defective? Fuck you, no, man. We, there's there's things we're treated poorly. You know, if you have a skill, serve people. 
Use your skill to serve people. That's what you can do. Support Black-owned businesses. But that then Black people, we have to provide a service that's that's up to par, and that's a Black conversation. That, that, that. It's fucking nuanced, man. Don't make it. Let's not pretend like this is simple. I don't think anybody is. I don't think anybody is pretending it's simple. I think this is the start of the conversation. I think this is the start of the conversation, but... Let's, this is nuance, man. This is, there's black conversations things to be had, Latino people. There's huge parts of the Mex, you know, Mexican community in San Diego and California that hate black people. I know. I know for a fact. I know for a fact. Ask Benny. Benny will tell you. Benny will tell you what they call, what they even call darker skinned Mexican people. Just posted a video of this, this big Mexican guy with a chainsaw chasing people. He's like, don't let those N words fool you. Don't let those N-words fool you. Don't let them twist your mind. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Take it easy. All right. I think we're going to wrap up. How long was that, bud? Are you in there? 36 minutes. Boom. Easy peasy. So easy. Um, But yeah, so let's wrap it up. We have, uh, with those brothers coming on, um, coming on, come dropping tomorrow. This is going to drop today. Uh, later this afternoon. So thanks for listening. Um, got something dropping tomorrow. Got two dropping tomorrow. Benny, Jesse, and myself are going to... Actually, we'll drop that Wednesday. No live stream tomorrow. <coughs> no live stream tomorrow. We'll drop um, those brothers tomorrow. Benny and Jesse and kind of myself will drop Wednesday. Um, Corey George will drop Sunday. He'll drop Sunday. And uh, we will... Yeah, he'll drop Sunday, listen to it Monday, and then Monday I'll drop as well. So Monday morning, Corey George will be up. So we have a week of podcast episodes sharing black experiences. So take a listen. And uh, Eric underscore Big Mood Coach. Now look up, now you can look up Hearts Over Everything on YouTube. Like, subscribe, share, bet, 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 Big Mood TV on YouTube. Um, Ho Podcast on Instagram, that's our Instagram page. We're going to start building that up, I think. I don't fucking want to. I don't want to. But we're going to. Because that's what you fucking do. You show up and you do shit. Um, but we're going to wrap it up. Um, we're out. Boom. Vultures circling above. They all want a piece, but they don't even know my name. Nah. Won't get even to swipe for the train. Cloudy, ride to the airport. Get to get right for the plane. Customs, not like, wife in your hand.